Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on tailored, secure, cross-entity collaboration for the healthcare industry with Radiant One Federated Identity. My name is Kim Locke. I'm with Radiant Logic, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that your lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar. However, if you have a question, you may enter it in the question portal and we'll have a Q&A session at the end, if time allows. If we are not able to get to your question during the webcast, we'll send a personal email to follow up. Also, this webinar will be recorded and sent out along with a copy of the presentation slides within the next 24 hours. Our speaker today is Wade Ellery, Senior Solutions Architect at Radiant Logic. Wade has extensive experience in enterprise IT direct and channel software and services sales and management. He has in-depth knowledge and experience in enterprise IAM, IGA, risk and compliance and IT security challenges. Over to you, Wade. Thank you, Kim, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We have an actually record-sized crowd. I'm really quite impressed. It must be a, an excellent topic, although the title here may take a little explaining, and that's part of what I'm going to do over the next hour, is give you an understanding of what we're talking about when we mention tailored and secure cross-entity collaboration for the healthcare industry. I actually have two use cases that I'm going to talk about in detail also. So some real world experiences here so you can align what's going on with your own uh, company, the challenges that you're facing with how other companies in the uh, world have actually addressed this issue, the benefits they've received from integrating Radiant Logic and the challenges they were looking at that, that brought that all into play. So let's go ahead and get started today. And again, thank you all for joining. We will have a recording of this available for everyone when we're done and a copy of these slides. So don't worry about uh, screenshotting anything or, worrying, or, or uh, trying to keep up. Just sit back, relax, let me uh, hit you with a fire hose of information and then you can review everything at your leisure later. And um, so to basically give you an idea or an agenda of, of where we're going and why, why we're talking about Radiant Logic here, there's a number of ways to use Radiant Logic. Um, we've been described as a Swiss army knife. Uh, you may need a fish scaler one day, you may need a toothpick. Believe me, when you need a toothpick, you really do need a toothpick, so nothing else really works. Uh, a corkscrew, you don't wanna be out uh, on a nice picnic without a corkscrew. So having all those tools available to you give you the ability to address a lot of different challenges and be able to uh, meet the needs of a number of different use cases and scenarios. But sometimes it can be a little bit under challenging just to sort of focus on what's the most important one? What is the one that I need to work on today? What's the one that's gonna get this product in the door and solve my problems? Because I can see all these places in my organization where Radiant Logic can have an effect, but I need to be able to focus in on a particular scenario that will give benefit to my organization immediately, the low hanging fruit and build the confidence in the platform so then I can go do all these other things that I'm looking at. So what we're talking about today is really how to look at this from a business standpoint. What are the business side drivers, even more than the technology ones? And if you look at the business today, and this, is, this has been made more poignant by the advent of COVID and the need for companies to immediately become digital. We've all been working for years now on a tr digital transformation, on getting our customer identity management lined up, getting our companies more agile so they can focus their set themselves on uh, and increasing revenues and pivot when things change and be able to make adjustments very quickly. Well, that business agility is, is a real challenge. And with the advent of COVID now, the need for us to be able to adapt and change becomes even more critical. But in a lot of scenarios, you're also looking at consolidating. You're consolidating through mergers and acquisitions, but even more so now, we're looking at companies seeing that they have holes in their portfolio and going out and getting partners to consolidate with, to, to work with in order to fill those gaps and be able to give themselves more functionality and be able to meet the needs of the marketplace in a much faster and more agile way. You can partner with somebody a lot faster than you can build what they've built. Um, and you, you may look at acquiring them at some point down the road, but even the challenge of mergers and acquisitions and negotiations and lawyers and stock reviews and challenges from the EU for monopoly uh, concerns, those all make everything slower. So in today's agile environment, you need to be able to quickly be able to work with other organizations uh, very effectively. And we'll talk about that in detail today. To do that, you need a single place to go to get all your identity information because you've got critical systems, especially in the healthcare industry of 
Epic and Kronos and Cerner and other healthcare specific applications that are central to the functioning of your operations and that require you to be able to share this information very quickly, very effectively across a large number of, of identities, especially from different organizations. But on top of that, you've got HIPAA requirements and personal information restrictions and a lot of security around those scenarios. So again, it's not a situation where you can simply just throw open the door, invite everybody over, have a big party and clean up afterwards. You really need to manage this process. But if you look at it from the end user standpoint, he's more concerned about getting his job done, not getting one more thing I have to worry about, not more one more credential I have to remember, not three more steps I have to go through to get access to something. I, I tell you honestly, just getting into uh, video sharing and video conferencing software now is three more steps than it used to be. I don't know why I have to click on a link and then click on an open this application and then click on a I'm already and then click on let's go. It, it should be just one step and in, but these the platforms now have gotten more complicated, I think, because they're trying to add some level of security or they don't want you to inadvertently pop up on the screen in your bathrobe. But that adds friction to my experience. It frustrates me every time. And when you're doing something large and global and, and, and commercial across your whole organization, and you're doing it for the purposes of making your company more effective and, and, and more profitable, you don't want to add friction to the experience. So we'll talk about how to remove that friction, how to make it appear seamless to the user. You're getting more and you're not having to do anything extra. That's a benefit. If you're getting the same and you're having to do more, that's a detriment. So we want to add, we don't want to take away. And we want to layer in security without anybody knowing it. So these are all critical considerations. But you need to have a complete solution. You need to be able to handle the user from, from start of the day to end of the day throughout all the processes they go through, whether that user is a customer or that user is an internal employee in your organization, or whether that user may be somebody working at another organization you're partnering with who needs access to resources to meet the demands you put upon them. So you need to be able to have the ability to do single sign-on and registration and user management and all the aggregation of different identity sources together to give you that, that complete solution which Radiant can provide. And then on top of this, we're talking about scale now like we've never seen before. We're talking about customer-side identity that scales to millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. We're talking at 280 million objects in one of our customers in a European telco. So we're looking at basically that almost the population of the United States managed underneath uh, a Radiant Logic umbrella. So the ability to scale to that level and be highly available, highly uh, resilient, and be able to be distributed around the world is critical to being able to deliver this solution. You can't meet these requirements and then deliver it on something that's down every couple of days or has issues or, or doesn't seem to have the speed. I've noticed a lot of SaaS applications now slowing down, things are taking longer. I know we got more people up on the cloud, more people doing things, but I don't think a lot of these organizations have built out the infrastructure or they built as far as they could and they're now hitting their head against limitations. So that scale starts to affect everything else in this list. So you have to be able to scale and perform. Uh, and again, this is something Radiant Logic is built to provide. So let's talk a little bit about what, how we got where we are today. What is this world we're in? And I, and I can't necessarily uh, handle the questions of uh, where the virus come from and, and why are we being punished? Um, but I can talk about the IT industry and what's happened in that model. And if you think about the, um, the transformations we've gone through in the last five years, this start at the idea of the cloud. Seven years ago, maybe, and I have to keep adding a year every time I, I tell this story, but um, I, I honestly argued that the cloud was a, uh, a, a, a fad, and it was going to go away, and and you know, it was, eventually one day it would just disappear because it really wasn't effective and it wasn't cost effective, and it, and it really decreased security and functionality and yada yada yada. Well, I was wrong, uh, and I missed a lot of opportunities to buy some really good uh, SaaS stocks. But what we have now is a world where applications are no longer housed only inside my organization; they are outside my organization. They are at uh, SaaS vendors that own the apps that, that rent them to me. They're out in public clouds. They're out in partner organizations where I am asking a business partner of mine to give me access to an application they have in order to do things on their network that need to be done in order to fulfill our partnership. 
and I'm doing the same on the other side. I'm offering partners that I'm working with that same access to applications inside my system. So this whole application world has exploded. And if you can imagine the whole key to security and authentication and authorization and risk-based access control goes back to applications. Applications are the tip of the spear where all this rubber meets the road. You've got to be able to control that environment. But now who am I controlling it for? It used to be just employees. So if you didn't follow company policy, we walked you out the door and got somebody who could. And I just had to make sure that the walls around my castle were tall and I had guards in the parapets. But that's not the world I live in anymore. I'm now uh, managing and, and supporting customers. I can't tell customers, if you don't act the way I want you to, you have to leave. I would get fired. I, I'm being basically told whatever the customer wants, make it happen and try and keep the security wrapped around it if you can. And also with partners, I can't necessarily manage a partner the way I manage a contractor or an employee. So I have to be able to act with these resources differently than I do in the past. I have to be able to manage those identities in a whole new paradigm. And then to throw in the three, the third axes there, the green one, um, the systems that people are using to access my platform, the desktop machines, the laptops, the mobile devices, the phones, they're not mine to control anymore. I don't necessarily have complete visibility into them. I have to make decisions about risk and access control and how I'm going to make that information available on platforms that I can't even necessarily see or monitor. So this becomes very dangerous from a security standpoint, but I have no vote. I have to provide this functionality. I have to be able to continually to innovate. I have to be able to say yes when someone comes down from on high and says, we're going to do this new initiative and we need you to make it work. Oh my God, you understand what you're asking? Okay, yeah, sure, I'll take care of it. Well, that can be daunting, especially in the world we live in where traditionally our platforms, our systems have lived as islands and they've accessed the identity information, which is your last perimeter. Identity is all you have left that you can actually see and manage and get your arms around and then use that as the fulcrum to control security and access and vulnerabilities and functionality and make that seamless business process work while still being secure and not opening up the castle to an invasion. But the infrastructure you inherited wasn't designed for that kind of function. It was designed for, hey, I'm an application. I know what I want. I go and get it exactly the way I want it. And I, I keep it for myself and I don't share with anybody else. And you better make that endpoint look the way I want or I'm gonna complain. And you're gonna have to stand up a whole new system to support me because I'm more important than your backend platforms. And you end up doing that. You end up standing up LDAP directories and databases and new infrastructure and doing all this extra work and standing up instances in AWS to meet the requirements of the application that somebody above you decided they were gonna roll out. Um, and this can be really challenging because these applications don't necessarily fit easily into your infrastructure. And the ones you already have have dependencies and requirements. So if you look at this little diagram here, you end up building scripts and you end up building lines and lines of code and, and connectors and one-to-one -one associations between applications and sources. And this quickly becomes unsupportable and untenable. And if you try and actually expand this model, it collapses under its own weight. And heaven forbid that somebody builds a complex scenario that works and then leaves and says, hey, it's yours to manage now. Well, manage how? You didn't document anything. I have no idea what magic you did to get this to work. I can't figure it out. And no one's a no one's willing to touch it because it's a career ender. If I break the customer management application because I don't understand what it's doing, I'm, I own it. I'm going to be carried out the door with it. So people just basically put their heads down and, and hope that nothing breaks. That's no way to live. It's, it's got to be torturous. So what we've done for the, for the customer side, because the customer complaint in that scenario is I've got 35 accounts, 35 passwords. They're not the same. I have to log into different systems every day. I've got this long list taped to my, my monitor that the um, I have to hide every night so that the person who comes in and, and cleans the building doesn't see it, um, or my security manager doesn't walk by and see it sitting there. But every time I get a new system, I got to add another password and ID to my platform. That for them is, is challenging and difficult, and that bubbles up and management hears it. So what do you do? Well, you put in a single sign-on solution. You do today what's called modern authentication which is a cool new term for we're going to put everything in the cloud and use saml or openid connect to get to it 
And so the end user is going to authenticate once locally to their desktop, once to a portal, once somewhere, and then get access to all these SaaS applications. And we're going to pretend that the on-premise LDAP applications don't exist anymore because we're doing modern authentication and nobody wants to do legacy authentication. So let's just look at the world that way. Well, that works great if everything's in the cloud or everything is a SaaS-based application or OpenID Connect, or you're migrating that direction. But the challenge on the back end is the same. You can still see those crisscrosses. The single sign-on platform you put into place, whether that's something in the cloud like Okta or Azure or something on-premise like Ping or OpenID or, or uh, Fordrock or IBM or IO or Oracle, whoever access management platform you're using, they still have to now connect to all those back-end platforms and sort out all that identity data and, and support that legacy infrastructure. And this is not something you can easily consolidate. There was a move three or four or five years ago about, hey, merge everything into one big Active Directory domain and you'll be fine. Well, that was millions of dollars, literally millions of dollars customers spent trying to get into that model and years and got nowhere. They, you can't merge everything into one big directory uh, that is static and expect everything to work because everyone doesn't expect the same information. Everyone, every application doesn't necessarily need the same data or they need it just the way they want it in a particular protocol and schema and structure and format and set of users so if you've got a one-to-many model and everybody has to march to the same tune you're going to get chaos because everyone's going to divert off and do what they want and you end up rebuilding this platform here and you make that identity provider the single sign-on solution struggle to be able to meet the requirements and, and fulfill the needs of all the users now, if you're looking at, at adding the complexity of let's look at a partner model, and this is part of the theme of today's um, use cases, and we'll get to those in more detail. I'm looking at, hey, can I actually share information between organizations? Well, I just illustrated how complex and difficult it is to share information within my organization. Now I'm going to multiply this by n, uh, some large exponential number because I'm now creating more connections to more systems across these partner environments to give them access to platforms and identities in different places. And I'm now trying to sort out identities that I don't even manage or don't even understand or not formatted the way mine are. Um, and I'm now making this even more difficult. And if I take shortcuts, if I don't do this right, I'm exposing my organization to major security vulnerabilities. Not only can I expose personal information or patient information or company IP to the outside world inadvertently and give it access to the wrong person, I'm opening up more vectors of attack. So if my partner isn't as secure as I am and somebody penetrates them, I've got a bridge built between our buildings. Just come on across. There's no guard there. You're in the front door of my partner. You're in my building. So I have to be able to manage this in a way that's not just simply building more connected, scripted, static bridges between my sources and my targets in order to solve my immediate problem. This solves one problem for today. It creates three problems for tomorrow. This is not the direction to go. What you want to do is you want to look at correlating and aggregating and normalizing all the identity data in one place. Now, this may sound like I am telling you, you need to use a meta directory, which if you've been around long enough, you remember meta directories. We're going to build one big, large LDAP directory. We're going to synchronize all the information into that directory. We're going to build one schema, one structure, one format, and we're going to have one LDAP protocol to access it. And everybody's going to use that, and my job will be simple. Well, the problem was that every application didn't necessarily need or want or able or was able to consume the information in the one format, one schema, one structure, one protocol that, that meta, the meta directory offered. It was a great idea to have one place to go to get everything you need, but applications need different information different ways. So you have to be able to present that data simultaneously in different views and schemas and structures and subsets of users in different protocols. And this is the magic of radiant logic. That blue sphere allows us to connect to multiple backend systems and pull that data into radiant logic. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we can make it highly performant and highly reliable and accurate. But just basically getting that data into radiant logic, we can then create simultaneously 
multiple views of the data. So Kronos sees all the users in the hierarchical reporting structure that it's used to because it needs to be able to authorize pay schedules and authorize hours and authorize people's uh, expenses. So it needs to have a relationship between department, manager, direct report, and subordinates so it can do that kind of work. So I need to be able to build an architecture and structure that, that supports that. Epic is looking at my customer information. So I now have a single source now that can aggregate both my customer patient data and it can aggregate my um, internal operating data and the people that use Epic that have to be in a flat tree because Epic's using the single sign-on site, single subtree search. So I put everyone in a flat list for Epic so they can all authenticate and authorize from whatever backend AD domain they may keep their credentials in. And I have other applications with other requirements. So simultaneously in Radiant Logic, I can tailor the view of the data, what the application sees, to what that application needs. So I get the best of both worlds. One place to go to get everything you need, and everybody gets everything they want exactly the way they want it, as if they were the only application there in the world, which satisfies their needs for integration and makes everything easier, makes it all work. But I'm feeding this from multiple sources of identity on the back end, and I'm normalizing all this data so it can be consumed by these platforms and I'm tailoring it to their particular needs. That's water into wine. That's tin into gold. That is amazing, the capability of doing that. So if you, if you take a look at what Radiant Logic can do, if you build this model and you correlate the identity information from multiple AD domains, multiple databases, directories, applications, cloud-based applications, Really, Radiant Logic doesn't care where the data comes from. What it cares about is can I connect over a standard protocol? Can I pull the data forward into Radiant Logic? And then can I work with the data in order to aggregate the same user across multiple platforms? So that Jay Smith in one system and John Smith in another system and J121 in another system all gets pulled together into one identity. So I have a rich profile across all those systems. And can I model that information, normalize it, and present it to my applications the way they want it? If I can say yes to those questions, then Radiant Logic can solve this problem. And we've been solving this problem for 20 years at some of the largest organizations in the country. And we'll talk about it in the use cases today about how when you add Radiant Logic to this scenario, you address the need to have tailored identity information available at the speed of a directory at scale, highly available for each application in just the way they need it from any number of sources of data across the bottom there. Now this model works when you add in partner directory data. So if you look on the left-hand side there in the bottom, there's a little gray directory pyramid or uh, triangle. That's partner data. That's data I'm getting outside my organization. I'm providing identities from outside my organization into Radiant Logic so I can tailor a view so they can access certain applications in my organization. I'm not merging them together with all my other data so they can wander around and see everything. I'm not putting in an AD forest trust between you and your partner so this person can get in and get access to everything. I am bringing those identities into Radiant. Inside Radiant, I'm creating a tenant model for those identities. I can shelter them, I can wrap them, I can isolate them, or I can join them with other identities internally, but expose them selectively to certain applications in only certain ways and only allow certain functions and not let those partner identities hop around inside the system and go looking around at other things. They only see the world that I expose to them and the applications see a larger population. They don't care whether the users came from a partner or from the back end uh, corporate identity stores. They just see more users to authenticate, authorize, and give access to. And at the Radiant Logic level, I can also build additional access controls, dynamic groups, and other attribute-based functions here that let me control that access on a granular level so that now when the partner is in my system, I can be very selective about what he has access to and what he can do. So let's talk about an actual use case. How, how do you then apply this in the real world? Does this really work? It sounds like it's magic. I don't think anybody ever uses this. This is a great pitch for a VC conference, but come on, we're talking about the complexity of the real world. How do you make this work? Well, as I said, we've been doing this for 20 years. This is an out of the box, ready to go product. It is configured with a mouse and wizards or a command line, depending on your preference. 
this is not a scaffolding development platform that you're going to be building in cubicles with developers working for six months to try and replicate what you saw in the demo. This is actual out of the box, ready to go, configured and deployed software. Our CEO's basic philosophy is if this is a mission critical application and our customers have requirements to make it work and integrate in the real world, we should integrate those functions into the product and we have. This is built off of the real world coming back and saying, hey, the fact that you can actually aggregate two AD domains together and route authentication to each back end um, without a trust in place is awesome. Hey, can you actually now uh, merge the groups for those two different domains together in the common group model? That's a great idea. Yes, we can. And it's done automatically. It's done with a wizard. It's not done with code. So this is a functioning product that can work today. So at this particular company, this is a pharmaceutical company, they made a decision to merge with another pharmaceutical company, which is a pretty common scenario where companies actually merge together in order to get synergies. Now, a lot of organizations, when they merge, they basically just swallow the smaller company, take all the users out of the smaller company, create them in the new company like they were all new hires, and then burn the old company to the ground because nothing was there. What I was buying was I was buying employees and I was buying a customer list and I was buying some, some intellectual property. But when you're talking about a pharmaceutical environment, when you're talking about manufacturing vaccines and, and manufacturing drugs, this is a platform you can't burn to the ground. A lot of the value of that second company B is in their, their systems, their processes, their machinery, their integrated uh, environments, their applications they developed. That's what you wanna integrate. So you really have to merge these companies together in a way that's different than an acquisition. It actually is, is bringing these together. So in a lot of scenarios, you end up with very large companies bringing in multiple smaller companies in order to uh, benefit from all the research and development that small companies did. The small companies took all the risk. If they got a winner, then their payoff is a big company will buy you, pay you up front for your winner, incorporate you into their massive manufacturing processes and be able to make billions of dollars. So there's billions of dollars at stake in this model when you're bringing this in. Now, if this fails, if you don't integrate these companies effectively, if you break all the things in company B that you paid for, not only do you lose the value of your investment, you lose the upstream revenue, you lose the 10 years before patent expiration value of what you're bringing together. So this is very important that you need to be able to have these two environments immediately leverage shared services. They need to be able to work across these environments and you have to be able to quickly understand that they're gonna have identity overlap and identity conflicts and you need to be able to match, manage this environment and match those identities appropriately to make this all work. So you wanna do this without impacting the business. You can't tell everyone, okay, we're gonna take off the month of August and we're gonna do all this work and come back in September and it'll be a new company and you'll have a new ID and everything will be fine, you'll go forward. You have to paint the car while it's driving down the freeway. You can't wait and stop the processes. And you can't do this as a giant rip and replace. You can't, in the background, build this behemoth on a Friday night, cut over on the weekend, turn it on on Monday morning, and hope it all works. Because if it doesn't, you just destroy the company. So literally, you could bankrupt someone when these systems fall apart because these are, these are platforms that don't handle change well. They don't handle disruption well. And you're in a marketplace where decisions are made weekly. You know, if you look at the stock market today and the prices of things that have gone up and down in the COVID experience, you can see how quickly the market responds to a positive or a negative outcome. So if you mess up integrating these companies, you could really damage things. You could have an impact on business. So what we're doing here now is we're using Radiant Logic to give you this abstraction layer, this benign layer that can connect to both backend systems without disrupting your platform. We're not ripping anything out and trying to replace it. We're synergistically living with the other systems. We're a symbiotic model where we add value to the relationship. We give back to the host more than we get from the host because we're gonna consume all the identity data from both organizations on the bottom there, bring it together in Radiant Logic, and then make it available for applications, again, specifically as they need to see it. What filters said of users, I want the R&D people uh, working on viruses, from company B working with my R&D people working on virus uh, manufacturing in company A, I want those two groups to come together and get access to the virus management software application that company B built. Great, no problem, we can do that. And easily and quickly. 
So that's the kind of synergies you can start to build in an organization when you have the ability to manage identity data, bring it together, correlate it, normalize it, reformat it, and present it to the application just the way that it's needed. Now, there's another scenario here that's even more challenging, and this is the temporary access scenario. This is the <clears throat> I'm not merging and acquiring scenario where I'm going to build some systems here that are going to be long-term integrations that I'm going to be able to keep, and I'm eventually going to absorb or and, and, and operate as one large functioning company with immediate benefits from Radiant and getting these two companies working together. Here I'm looking at a, at a scenario where I clearly am going to need to very, very quickly bring organizations together, but I don't want to do it in a way that I can't easily pull them apart. I need to have this bridge in between that everyone can transit across, but that I can dynamite when necessary, because this is a temporary process. So I can't just throw up a trust between two organizations, because if I do that, I'm going to end up with a scenario where I've now opened up the gates to everything in that other organization. And there's two big challenges there. One, I'm partnering with this company for a particular purpose. And if I'm a giant pharmaceutical company with 33,000 employees working in 18 countries, selling my products around the world almost everywhere, I've got a tremendous amount of systems and processes and products and R&D going on in my organization. And I'm gonna partner with a, another company for a specific purpose, not to share all, every, everything, but one little niche, one little piece of that giant company is gonna be exposed to this partner. Well, if you just simply do the old, let's set up a trust and everybody can authenticate on both sides and we'll do some kind of uh, external alien group membership resolution deal, you're gonna open up the gates to everything. So this little company that you're partnering with, because they had a great manufacturing process for making disposable syringes for virus vaccinations, yeah, you just showed them everything you've been doing for the past 20 years in IP that's worth billions. Never gonna happen. But I need to be able to give them access to certain resources because we have to work together. We have to do it fast because we have to be able to get things to market. We're being driven now by a pandemic. We can't sit around and have a three-year process of talking about talking about stuff. I need to be in action. So how do you address this? How do you build a scenario where you can bring companies together in a way that they can share information, they can share access, but you can still secure and lock this down. You want to be able to get the most out of your R&D efforts. You don't want to hobble people. You don't want people coming back and saying, I can't do my job because I can't get access to this particular application. And I've been sitting here for a week and all of my project timelines and milestones are now in the red because uh, there's a barrier here and no one seems to be able to find a way around it without opening up too much access. And I need, again, to keep that access control because I've got intellectual property here. I need to be able to say definitively, you have access to this piece of this puzzle and you can look at it and do what you want with it, but you can't see any other parts of the puzzle and I can take it away anytime I want to. And if you need more access, yeah, it's fine. I can get it to you, but we have to understand why and we need to be able to do it in little chunks. And a lot of times you'll get frustrated and you'll say, well, just give access to everything. We'll sort it out afterwards. <laughs> you know, that's when really bad things happen. But now you need to be able to add in automated provisioning and deprovisioning of this access because if you start to have administrators dealing with every little thing, you need to be able to have a governance system in place that can take requests and have them authorized and run them through segregation of duties and, and policy enforcement and deliver that information. But to drive any kind of governance platform, you have to have identity information from all sources. And it has to be normalized and it has to be correlated and it has to be in a, in a way that the governance product can easily consume it. If you point your governance product just directly natively at a backend platform on a, at a partner, it's gonna spend months of coding, back to coding, trying to sort out all that information, try to figure out how to use it and how to control it. So you need an abstraction layer to be able to do this, but you also need to be able to support this platform at the layers of attributes. Because when you start doing this kind of sharing, you can't share on a macro level. It's too much. You have to share on a micro level. You have to share on an attribute based level. You have to say, if you're in La Jolla, California, and if you're in lab 27, and if you're working on project 19, you have access to this application at this layer. That's granular access control. That's attribute based access control. And this is exactly what was implemented for this particular 
mega pharmaceutical company in order to be able to partner with smaller organizations for particular projects and particular functions, whether it's using a manufacturing process to get a drug out the door, whether it's taking in a new promising uh, efficacy or drug from a particular uh, small vendor who took all the risk and had a lucky day and making that part of your larger model, whether it's actually examining things in a, in a particular partnering scenario that you may or may not decide to go forward with, you need to control that access on the attribute level, on the granular level, on a policy-based level. So with Radiant Logic, we can absorb all those identities regardless of where they're located, whether they're in the partner, whether they're in the primary company, whether they're in databases, directories, and applications sitting in the cloud, they may have stuff up in Workday and success factors and, and service now that you need to extract and bring in. We can bring all that information into Radiant into what's called a policy information point. This is the identity information that the policies are going to be built on. Then you build your policies based on the data in the policy information point and data that Radiant Logic has normalized. We've taken all the variations of the way that everybody spelled states like California, capital C, California, capital C, L, I, F, period, C, A, L, capital C, little a, all the different ways that's done, we've normalized it down to two capital letters for every state. So when you go in to do a policy to say, if you're in California, all you have to do is define capital C, capital A, regardless of how that information is stored on the back end, we don't ask people to change that, we do it at our layer. So we're not only bringing information together, we let you manage that data, you can reformat it, you can concatenate information together, you can trim things, you can normalize data, you can you can re-label information as the way that it's needed. So when you're doing your policy design and policy authoring, you're building off of a data set that's easy to work with and is very fast and efficient. And is the exact same data set that your policy decision point, that little blue circle in the middle there, when it gets a request for access, it brings that request back and says, okay, I need to make a decision this user wants access to this resource under these circumstances at this time in this place. Give me all the data you have about that user. I'm going to map it to that policy. If it all fits, yes, I'm going to get them in, let them in. If any of those attributes or values don't map back to my policy positively, I'm going to block them. That's what the poly decision point does. It evaluates the policy based on the identity information and the request of the policy itself and gives you an answer. And the policy enforcement point at the bottom there is the guy who delivers the news. So the PDP doesn't have to ever tell the user, no, you can't have access. It just makes a decision because it's the policy enforcement point. He delivers the success or the failure of access and the user then goes on. So this is a critical solution to implement in this scenario, but to do this, you have to have a rich set of attributes because you're building policies that are very granular, knowing what department, what title, what location, what building, what project, what manager is critical data. Um, what what patients a doctor is, is responsible for is going to control what he can see access to. What scenario he's in, he's in the emergency room. Great, I got more access in the, in the emergency room because I've got break glass scenarios because I can't wait for authorizations to be requested. I am a uh, oncologist who does rounds in the hospital. Great, I've got access to the information I need to see about that patient, but I can't see his mental health information because that's not appropriate for me to see. I'm an oncologist. So this kind of granular control becomes critical in the platform. So how do we do this? Well, with Radiant Logic, of course. <laughs> this is the critical linchpin that sits between the sources of identity and the consumers of identity that solves these problems. How do I get square pegs and rectangular pegs and hexagonal pegs into a round hole? How do I get square pegs and round pegs into square holes and round holes and hexagonal holes? I've got this one-to-many, many-to-one scenario of information that I have to be able to manage, control, secure, and deliver in different scenarios, different views, protocol structures, schemas, formats from multiple sources that may house that information completely differently. <clears throat> so with Radiant Logic, we let you leverage what you've already invested in. We're not saying you're going to stand up from scratch a whole new world to solve this problem. We're going to let you take what you already have and model that in ways that fit your requirements. So if you're looking at something like just a common access to all of your users across multiple AD domains, instead of consolidating to one AD domain, which breaks a horrendous amount of, of back-end group policy, access, application, uh, dependencies, legacy systems, we're going to be able to just mount these under a common root, 
provide a subtree search, and now you can use one point for your application, which can only talk to one directory, to access all the identity information across all three of your AD domains. This is a simple scenario here, but it solves some massive problems really easily because Radiant Logic is smart enough to know when a user comes in and, and that ID is presented, where to route back to find that user on the back end, where to validate his credentials. If his credentials are in, in domain two, I can actually route back to domain two and, and authenticate that user if he provides a username and a password. Um, but if he has credentials in domain two and domain three, because he exists in both, and he gives me domain three credentials, I can check domain two, those will fail, but I can hop right over to domain three and check his credential there just in case he used that one. If it's correct, I'm gonna go ahead and let him in if that's what you wanna do. So I've got scenarios here that remove the roadblocks to integrating multiple AD domains very quickly and very easily. But on top of that, again, as I mentioned, it's not just simply creating a, a common route for everything. Different systems have different requirements. They need to see information differently. They need to see different data in different ways. So within the Radiant Logic model, I have the ability to model data. If you look at hospital B and hospital C, I've got a completely different organizational structure in my tree there and the way my data is being presented. But if you look at between hospital A and hospital B, I've got a whole subset of identity data in hospital A that's that's present in hospital B, but missing in hospital A, because I can filter down the information I'm exposing. So I can expose it in a different format, structure, schema. I can expose more information, more users, more attributes. I can expose less users, less attributes. I can tailor this to the requirements of my application. So when you're talking about an attribute-based access code system, you wanna bring in all the attributes from all those sources across the bottom there and build this rich global profile but you're not gonna necessarily expose that whole profile in every scenario. You're gonna have times when you want a subset of that data for particular purposes that you wanna narrow that down so you can model that information, narrow it down and control that. Again, this is all done with a mouse. This is all done with wizards. So it's so simple, so straightforward, so easy to deploy. But if you look at the traditional model of, oh yeah, well I can build all this in databases and join database tables and I can make this myself. We'll just develop an in-house version of this. Thanks for the design consultation, but we got it from here. <laughs> ah, good luck. Um, because what you're gonna run into is the rollout of healthcare.gov, which was 10 years ago now. Man, am I dating myself. Um, this challenge was what they faced when they rolled out the original uh, healthcare.gov website. They tried to link in real time user information from their profile they created when they logged in, their uh, IRS records and their social security records to be able to merge together all the information to decide does this person deserve a particular discount on his insurance based on his income and his location and what he's doing and all this other stuff we have about him. Great. It took half a day or more for that system to correlate that data on the back end in real time and try to get an answer back to people. People literally got on television because they said, I've been sitting here for six hours waiting on this screen and the wheel's still spinning because on the back end, I'm trying to do database joins in real time and aggregate across millions of users. You can't do it in real time. It doesn't work. You have to have a platform that can do this work ahead of time and build a rationalized view of this data, store that in a highly available, highly scalable model, and then make that information available at the speed of a directory. But listening on the back end for changes to those sources, because those are the sources of truth, and applying those changes as close to near real time as possible. You have to have a platform that performs, and you can't do that with joining database tables. I'm sorry, it's just the technology is not there. You can do it with Radiant Logic. That's what we're built for. Now, on top of that, you're looking at a scenario here where I need to be able to merge attributes from multiple systems and join those together. So I need to understand different hierarchies, different structures, different schemas, different protocols on those sources. And then I have to make those joins. If you do them again manually, you're gonna suffer from that. With Radiant Logic, we will pre-calculate that join from all those systems. We understand that things are in different protocols and structures. We'll let you model what you want that to look like. We let you put database information and LDAP information and information from a web service like Workday all together and make that look like you want. Build it into that unified view of attributes and put it into a common structure so it can be searched, accessed, and, and leveraged at the speed of a directory. And that golden pyramid in there is storing this result on disk. 
So we have infinite capacity to store large sets of data that we've brought in from the back end and we've correlated. So when you're making the call, you're getting a pre-correlated identity. But again, on the back ends, as anything changes, we're gonna detect that change. We're gonna flow that change up into Radiant Logic. That blue logic engine sphere is gonna kick in, recalculate all the associations, recalculate all the group memberships, recalculate all the attributes, flow those changes through all the stored versions of that user's profile for different purposes, and make sure that information is available at the speed of a directory and accurate to the last update from the back end. So this delivers at scale the capability of providing that information you're looking for. And now we're basically providing this information to, to the policy server so they can do its attribute-based access control. So at this large pharmaceutical company, we merge together on the Radiant level without them having to worry about making these two companies operate on the same shared network and chain infrastructure and, and merging things on their main platforms, but virtually brought the companies together in the Radiant Logic world, built the rich attribute policies, fed that to the policy server that does attribute-based access control, and now they're able to let their users work cross company, cross project, cross function seamlessly. For the end user, it just seems like I get what I need because I need it because that's the way my wonderful company works. And on the back end, Radiant Logic is juggling 13 balls in the air at the same time, but doing it with such a smooth hand motion that you think this is easy. I could probably juggle 13 balls in the air at the same time. Well, again, we've been doing this for 20 years. We've got a lot of practice. We've been through a lot of scenarios. We've solved a lot of customer challenges. We've built that functionality into the product. This is the only place you're gonna find it. And from a performance standpoint, we've optimized the platform for speed and for high availability by creating our HDAP store, that golden pyramid that lets you store information at the Radiant Logic level and then make that information available. Now, if that stored information in the Radiant Logic level was not highly available, if it was bottlenecked because in traditional LDAP infrastructures, and we learned this by using traditional LDAP from other third parties that made that available as open source, and there is a whole world of LDAP directories out there that all came from the original sun seed of LDAP or, or iPlanet's original LDAP specification, now version three. Those systems have inherent challenges because they use LDAP to replicate between servers and to get more availability to be able to serve a larger user population, you stand up multiple servers in a cluster or in an in a environment and then you have to synchronize those servers because every time there's a change, it has to be replicated across those servers. And because it's difficult to write to an LDAP directory, they have to have write-only servers stood up. So I've got five data servers, two write-only servers. And now if I'm gonna replicate data between my location and another location in a different data center, I have to have replication servers. So I set up a pair of replication servers. And then in the other system, I do the same thing. And now I've got nine or 10 servers stood up to be able to support this environment. With Radiant Logic, it's three servers in a cluster. Replication is built in. Replication is handled internally by the cluster itself. And we've added block level replication between those servers in the cluster. So we eliminate the contention between synchronizing data between servers to give high availability and, and broad access and keeping everything in sync and overloading or competing with the end user LDAP request with that LDAP synchronization. We're doing it at the block level, completely different channel. So our replication and synchronization never competes with the end user's request. If you look at this chart, traditional LDAP at a certain level of connectivity, certain level of load will start to fall down because it's now trying to process changes and it's just processing those changes in the same channels that it's accessing or data and giving answers to requests and it fails to be able to scale in that model. If you look at the HDAP graph, it's very flat. This is critical. You can't build to scale in this model. You can't work with the pharmaceutical companies that are that are deployed in, in uh, 30 countries around the world if you can't manage this traffic seamlessly in a flat line um, on scale to millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of objects. So we deliver identity as a fundamental security service. So identity is there to authenticate and authorize the user. Authenticating is I know based on what you provided to me, uh, a user ID, a password, a fingerprint, uh, a two-factor authentication token, an RSA token, a CAC card, whatever information you provided to me, I understand you are John Smith. 
and I've validated that, and I've used the system to validate that. And if I have multiple sources of identity that I can validate you against, Radiant Logic can route that uh, credential validation across the back end. So now that I've authenticated you, I know you are John Smith. That's half of the puzzle. You have to go further than just authenticating. Just saying you're John Smith is great. Now you're looking at the application saying, well, because I'm John Smith, I have access to application A. It's the Walmart model. I go in the front door and I can go to any department. And I can do anything. I can buy a gun. I can buy a fishing license. I can get bananas. I can get a new shirt. I can go anywhere in the store, which is great for Walmart. They want you everywhere buying everything. But if you look at applications, especially in this model where I'm using idea of attribute-based access control to granularly grant access within the application to certain values, I can't just let you in the front door and go anywhere you want. I have to control what you do. I have to authorize your access. And if you've heard the term zero trust, and then maybe you have, maybe you have, and it's a fairly new term, I'm joking. Everybody knows what zero trust is now, but doesn't really necessarily understand what it means or how to do it. Zero trust is just basically saying when you get authenticated, that's great, nice to know you, no access for you until I authorize your access based on information I know about you and what you're doing to say that access is, uh, is correct for this circumstance. So I don't trust you at all coming in and I'm gonna increment you in steps for more authorization to more systems by making more requests for more information about you and validating against that policies I have in the system or our access controls or segregation of duty, whatever I'm doing to, to control that access and authorize you in a granular model. This is also continuous authorization. It's risk-based authorization. It's minimum privileges. It's the idea that I need to give you just what you need to do the job you need to do right now, but I have to do this in a way that's seamless to the end user. I can't make him throw his laptop against the wall every time I once again have to go through a spinning wheel for 15 minutes to figure out whether or not this person should be able to take the next step in his journey um, because I have to authorize this now and it takes a lot of time to pull that information and get it all together. It has to be available at the speed of a directory. It has to be instantaneous, millisecond times, so the user doesn't even know it's happening. It should perform better than my Salesforce does because I click on a, on a link in Salesforce to go to projects and it spins that wheel for about 30 seconds before it loads that page up. I don't like it. It should be faster than that. This should be faster than that. And Radiant Logic gives you the ability to deliver that be able to modernize your infrastructure to deliver this kind of functionality and these kind of features. So to summarize what we're talking about today, and I'll, and I'll recap a little bit, we talked about two use cases. One was the merger, the outright merger use case. But the challenge with merger is the traditional mergers, and if you talk to the customers we talk to that have done it the old fashioned way, it takes years. It's three years since they merged and they still have pieces of that old company laying around. There's legacy platforms they can't deal with these uh, old domains that are needed for this one application we just can't get off of. So the, the traditional model for merger takes too long. It, it delays the synergies and the benefits of a merger. It doesn't let people get working immediately. So with Radiant Logic, you have that capability of bringing these companies together virtually, immediately, and then taking all the time you need now to aggregate the back ends, to migrate users, to incorporate applications and systems into a new infrastructure to decide which of the three different single sign-on platforms you have between the two companies you want to standardize on? Because you can now move back ends and applications independently because Radiant Logic is in the middle and we're abstracting that information. You no longer have that tight coupling between applications and identity that makes it impossible to move. We've unshackled your infrastructure. That's critical. Now, also, if you're looking at the other model, you're looking at the I've got a need to work with another company uh, temporarily. I need to share certain information with them, but gosh, not everything. I need to be able to monitor what they're doing. I need to be able to see exactly what it is. I need to be able to make sure that they're functional. I need to be able to incorporate some things they're doing into my system so my people can work. I need to be able to look like we're merging, but we're not really keeping them at arm's length. How do I make this magic happen? Radiant logic. It's that abstraction layer. That abstraction layer lets you control what flows down from the applications in terms of requests, what flows back in terms of responses, what information do I expose, what policies do I enforce, what information do I use to evaluate those policies. You have that rich aggregated set of identity information from all of your sources, partner and internal, that you can then use to build that granular access control that makes sure that people don't run amok 
once you started this relationship. And again, because we're abstracting the sources from the applications, decoupling the system is simply a matter of turning off the source. If I wanna say we're no longer working together because this project's finished, I simply sever the connection to the partner's backend identity sources. Those users no longer have access to the applications. I didn't break anything. I just made my population smaller. The, the company I was partnering with, I didn't break their infrastructure. I didn't tell them now you've got to rebuild your single sign-on platform because you're using mine and I just wiped it out. I let them work together to the degree they wanted to integrate and I let them separate easily. This is critical in the healthcare industry, but it's also critical in other industries. If you think of, of all the different companies now that work together, that work as partnerships, that, that build these relationships. If you're in oil and gas, yeah, there's a whole industry of, of exploration and, and uh, drilling and, and export and transport that you don't own, that you partner with companies to provide, but you may be partnering with one company on transporting natural gas on the East Coast and a different company transporting oil on the West Coast. You don't want these people talking to each other inside your network. You don't want them seeing each other. You don't want the guy on the West Coast necessarily even knowing what you're doing on the East Coast. So you've got to segregate these systems, keep them separate, be able to model them, but bring them together when you need to. And if you think about it from, the, from a DOD and a, and a government standpoint, you have scenarios where I need to do joint operations. I need to have the Coast Guard and the Navy and the Air Force all working together along with Japan for exercises in the Pacific. Well, that's four different organizations that run completely autonomous platforms that don't necessarily fit square pegs and round holes. How do I merge this together? How do I operate in that model? How do I do a joint exercise seamlessly, bring everyone together, everyone's there, can do what they need within that bubble, and then when it's done, how do I tear that bubble down so it's gone, so there's no bad operators that can go back to that legacy platform and say, oh, look at all this information laying around from this exercise from five years ago. I can spin it up, use it, spin it down as I need to. So it's a very powerful platform. And this allows you to do many things, especially just inside your own organization. You can expand your API gateway. You can make more applications available to more users. You can make more users available to more applications. You've got an existing web single sign-on internal infrastructure that needs one place to go to get everything it needs to authorize users. I joined this industry decades ago with the promise that mainframes were dead. Don't learn COBOL. Those are gonna go away any day now. They're still here. On-premise applications are dead. We're moving to modern, authentic modern authentication. That's all behind us now. Well, okay. Great, just from my own idea that you learn from history, I'm gonna say there's gonna be systems and platforms that are gonna be around for a long time. You may be moving totally to the cloud. There's some stuff that's gonna be bolted to the floor of your data center for years now. You may well get there at some point and smaller organizations may get there sooner, but don't do it in a scenario where you throw hand grenades around the, the data center to, to make things change. Use a model like Radiant Logic where you can seamlessly, simply, manage that information, bring that data together, abstract it from the sources and the applications, so now you can move or operate in a hybrid model where I'm in two different cloud vendors and I'm on-premise and I'm in two different continents and I'm managing all my personal information and I'm handling GDRP requirements and I'm providing data for my California privacy requirements and I'm doing this across multiple scenarios and multiple environments. This is what Radiant Logic provides you, is that capability. So I'm at the top of the hour. I'm not gonna be able to take any questions today, but I do wanna let you know that we are gonna be putting out a white paper in addition to this that outlines the um, use cases I was talking about today in addition to a copy of the recording and the slides from today, smart integration of the hospital identity environment. And again, I recommend you skim through that. It is excellent information, very well written, very concise, especially if you're starting a conversation, you want something to share with a, a management level person, um, this is a great introduction for them to take a look at. And I wanna say thank you again. We have another webinar in two weeks on the 17th of September, CIAM, Customer Identity Access Management, integrating customer data and identity to drive better experiences and smarter security. Everything we talked about today applies in the customer world with a whole nother layer of scale and a whole nother layer of, of customer interaction and the need to be frictionless and simple and easy and not frustrate them because customers can vote with their mouse. If you're hard to work with, if you're difficult, if things don't make sense, if you keep asking me to take a survey, 
I'm going to go someplace else and buy my mayonnaise and have it shipped in quantity because I can do that really easily. So you want to be easy to work with. You want to be seamless and simple. Thank you again, everyone. Again, a, a massive crowd today. I'm, I'm very impressed and very surprised. And thank you all for attending. Look forward to seeing you in two weeks. And take care, wear your masks, and be well.